there anything you're really bad at when it comes to videography? Because I am terrible at time lapses. But I've always wanted to get better at them. So I've come to Leeds to meet up with Emily from Micro Four Nerds, who does some of the most stunning time lapses I've ever seen. I am a time lapse nerd. <laughs> She's going to show us how to do it. So if you see some great time lapses in this video, then Emily's done a great job of teaching me. If you see some bad ones, then it's, it's all on me. It's nothing to do with Emily. <laughs> Anyway, good, yeah? So I think the main thing, the more movement, the better. If you can have more than one element of movement, you're probably gonna get a more engaging time lapse. So thinking of the clouds as movement, cars, people. And with that in mind, we're on this rooftop right now, the top level of a car park, and we've looked over all four sides, and it's not, it's not the best, I was expecting more to be honest. It's not the best, but it's not the worst. We've got a little market down that side. It's a little bit gray and dull. Over there, there's just a rooftop, so there's gonna be no movement there. That side, is a load of construction things. There's a bit of traffic there, but it's not the most pleasing image. But we've found two options. We've got one, this beautiful skyline here. Sorry, Emily, I nearly poked you in the eye. That's fine. That's fine. And we're gonna use the clouds as movement. And then on this side, there's a nice quiet street, but there's a train line that's going past. So we might set one up each and see what we can get. Rule number one, always use images instead of video. Don't film a video clip and speed it up and don't use the video that the camera stitches together for you in time-lapse mode, here's why. With images, you get higher resolution, therefore a better quality image. You get more flexibility over the color grading and you can be more creative over the effect that you get for example, you can add motion blur if you want to. Now it takes a little bit longer to create in your video editing software, but I guarantee it's definitely worth it. And that's where I was going wrong all this time. Now if it sounds daunting, don't worry because I'm gonna show you exactly how to do it throughout this video. And Emily's gonna help us answer some of the questions that I had, and hopefully that helps you as well. How do you know how long to go for whilst still having a long enough clip and a good enough clip? My train of thought is if you wanted to sell any of this as stock footage, then you need a minimum of five seconds and I think for what we'd use it for in our YouTube videos you only want sort of five to ten seconds maximum you don't want it to go on forever if you have a timeline for 25 or 24 what do you shoot in 25 25 so 25 <laughs> images equals one second we do the maths it works out maybe 10 15 minutes of shooting for a couple of seconds right. Emily's smarter than I am and she actually the does the maths <laughs> Sammy just goes um, stick it on for like 15 minutes or whatever but not knowing how long I'm gonna get. So if we want five seconds worth and we need 25 shots for each second we need five times 25 which is 125 photos. I make sure to capture 10 seconds worth just in case I need to delete any of the frames if anything gets in the way and that also means I've just got a little bit extra to play with. So I aim for 250 photos in total. Next you need to set the interval and this is the length of time in between taking each picture. When you have a shorter interval it looks like things are moving slower because whatever the subject is is traveling less distance in between each shot whereas if the interval is longer that subject has traveled further in between each shot which creates the illusion of speed something worth bearing in mind as well is if you have a shorter interval it's going to take less time to capture those shots so if you're in a bit of a rush definitely go for a shorter interval. Emily gave a little top tip. Put the bag on the hook of your tripod so it doesn't blow away. Because the thing is, these lightweight tripods are amazing, but on a windy day like this, they could, you know, fly away. I would recommend manual mode because if you have any aperture changes or exposure changes from frame to frame, it will look as like a flicker. <laughs> location number two now and we've chosen this tree to stand under because a it's raining and b there's a nice view of that street down there which might look quite cool but this time i've done something different and instead of going for a wide angle lens i've gone for a tight lens i'm at 100 mil at the moment on the 7200 it actually ended up raining on us that day in leeds so i came to london the next day to capture some more examples <laughs>
I noticed that if you use a longer interval with cars and people, it made it look like they were just popping out of nowhere and disappearing again, which made it look a bit scattered. So to add a little bit more natural movement, either shorten the interval or add motion blur by changing the shutter speed. When the shutter is open for longer, it adds motion blur, so it makes it look like that subject is moving even if you're taking a still shot. So even if you get one frame of a car, it still looks smooth. Just keep in mind that your exposure is gonna change, and if you're outside in a bright environment, you probably need to bring an ND filter with you. So once you have all your time-lapse images, transfer them onto your computer, and if you have multiple sequences, make sure you add them to separate folders and name them to stay organized. Drag all of the images into Lightroom one sequence at a time, edit one of the photos, and then copy and paste the edits to the rest of the images. Export all of these, then load them into your video editor timeline. Select all of the shots and change the duration of all the clips to one frame each. Watch the clips through, and if there are any distractions where anything stays on screen too long, for example, or like this taxi, which stops the flow, delete those frames. And that keeps your time lapse looking nice and smooth. Now select all of the images and create a new compound clip. And from here, you can add your keyframes or any zooms and transitions you want. This is a little bit frustrating. We've got this lovely skyline there, but in front of it is this sort of barrier thing. So it's difficult to get the framing. I wanted a really nice wide field of view with the 18 mil. I've had to go to 28 mil just to crop out these bars. It's a shame really, because that looks awesome. What we've learned from coming out today is that shooting time lapses is a lot harder than doing photo or video. Mainly because if you're taking a photo, you can pinpoint a specific area of a frame or a scene that you wanna take that photo of. And you can do the same with the video. But with time lapses, you have to make sure that the entire frame looks good and for the duration of your shot. So we've been filming in like 10 minute segments. Anything could obstruct the frame in that 10 minute time, so it's very difficult. Another big point about time lapses is location is everything. I've only been to Leeds once before and it looked beautiful. And today, it's just got the complete opposite vibe. I don't know if it's the weather. There's a load of roadworks. Doesn't make for the most inspiring image, but we did the best that we could. Hopefully this has helped you let me know what your favorite tip was down in the comments section below thanks so much for watching and i'll see you in the next one